Greetings, it's the Digital Dog, and what I've got for you today is a new video. Uh, I wanted to cover a topic dear and dear to my heart, good old sRGB, and this is a urban legend mistruth part one, because there might be many other parts. So this is what I'm going to cover today. This specific mistruth that I read uh, recently on the web. And I'll just read it to you. As a general rule, you will get the best results and highest quality by using the smallest gamut color space that encompasses all the colors needed for your image. In many cases, higher gamut color spaces merely reduces color accuracy. Boy, that sounds really scary. And then the author goes on and, and pretty much says basically the same thing, that most of your images are going to be into sRGB. And for the most accurate color you need to encode in sRGB if the image fits in sRGB and so on and so forth. And, and then finally suggests that using a wider color gamut when not needed will lead to lower color fidelity. What does that mean? Well, let's check this out. This kind of begs the question. So the, basically telling us that you'll get the best results and highest quality if you use the smallest gamut color space possible. So specifically, what we're going to look at is if you use a wider gamut color space, a wider gamut container, which is what we're really talking about, will this reduce quality? Will this produce an issue if you use a higher gamut color working space? So if you've seen my video, and the URL is down below, you'll see that if you work with a working color space that is smaller than the color gamut of the data you've captured, the result is you're going to clip colors. So that's, that's not anything earth shattering here. Um, so, but what happens if you use a larger color gamut working space than the actual image requires? Is this true? Will you reduce accuracy and produce some sort of issue on uh, the images that you're working with? Well, we'll see. Where's the color metric proof? Further, if we're going to talk about accuracy, we need to define a metric in what is and what isn't accurate. So a lot of what we're seeing here is basically text that has no real proof of concept. So first, before we begin looking at the proof of concept, let's just uh, make sure we're all on the same playing field here in terms of understanding about working spaces. And it's important to understand that RGB working spaces like Adobe RGB and sRGB and Profoto RGB are just containers. And they're very simple in terms of what makes an RGB working space. We'll look at that in a minute. But until a pixel is actually inserted or, or encoded inside a working space, they don't really contain any information. The significant difference in the different color spaces, as we see here, is the gamut or the range of colors. And if you've seen any of my other videos on this uh, topic, this is old news. One of the things that is different about RGB working spaces is their besides their gamut, is their gamma or their tone response curve or TRC. sRGB has a little tone response curve bump in the near shadows. Um, other color spaces have a, a real gamma encoding. And what I'm basically showing you here is on the left, sRGB and a uh, RGB value of 16, 16, 16, and the associated lab value, which is 500. Zero, zero. And on the right, Profoto RGB using the same triplets of RGB numbers, 16, 16, 16, has a lab value of 6. So there are some differences here that we see when we look at them up close. But basically, if you go into Photoshop, you could look at the sort of DNA of each of these RGB working spaces. And essentially, as you can see, the differences between, uh, we're really looking at the gamma encoding, which is different between the two, the white point, and the XY values for chromaticity values as you see below. And the XY values are really sort of like a GPS coordinate for the gamut of the primaries. So when you saw that plot in the last uh, image, the little triangles where RGB fall, that's basically what we're describing. Where do they fall? So to give you a simple analogy, these RGB working spaces are just containers. And Profoto RGB is a much larger container than sRGB. And the analogy I'm showing you here is that we have a, you know, a three cup uh, measuring cup on the left, which is Profoto RGB, uh, a two cupper on the right, which is sRGB. And if I were to fill the little container in the, in the middle with water and pour it into each container, 
essentially the water isn't changed by how it's being poured into those particular containers. Um, it's a very simplified analogy, but I think that's a good way to start. So what we need to do is talk about something called delta E. We have to talk about uh, a metric for defining color difference. Um, we're going to use this for the rest of the presentation, so I want to make sure those of you who may be new to delta E are familiar with this concept. There are several formulas for specifying delta E, which can complicate things. We're going to use delta E 2000, which is a... I would say a better formula for looking at very small differences in color differences. A delta E of one or less is invisible to the human observer. So what we're basically talking about is looking at the values of two solid pixels and coming up with a metric that says how different are they in terms of their visibility to the human observer. So if you have two color patches and they have a delta E of one or less, we can't perceive the differences. They look identical. And when you start getting into values of less than one delta E, it's insignificant and not really uh, worth talking about. The larger the delta E value, the bigger the visual difference. So here's sort of an example using a, a really great piece of software called Babel Color, CTNA. And what I've done is I've inserted on the left uh, lab values and on the right a different set of lab values and this software then calculates what is the delta E difference. And hopefully over the internet, you can kind of visually see what a delta E of 5.66 looks like. It's pretty subtle. And on the right side of the image, what Babel Color does really nicely is it shows you visually the differences in a 5.66 delta E, these two blues, using different surrounds. So it's blue against blue, blue against black, blue against gray, there's some text. And so, Hopefully you can visually see what a delta E of 5.66 looks like. It's pretty small. But again, if I were to use a delta E of 1, they would look absolutely identical to you. So th this is where we need to move forward when we talk about both accuracy and difference of color of solid patches, which is what we're going to do to evaluate whether or not this statement about smaller working spaces and larger working spaces is true. Accuracy. You hear people talk about accuracy a lot. Most of the time, they really don't know what they're talking about, so let's go there for a second. In order to evaluate accuracy, you need something called a reference or a color aim. Uh, what you're seeing here on screen is a Macbeth color checker that is in lab color space, and each one of the 24 patches of the Macbeth was created synthetically in Photoshop. In other words, just by copying and pasting the lab values as defined by originally Gray Tag Macbeth and now x -Rite, what the Macbeth should be in LAB. So lab tells us what a color should look like. So this is our reference. Uh, this is our color aim. So if you look at, for example, patch number one, um, we get a value of, in Photoshop, we'll use Photoshop for the time being, a lab star value of 29, 19, minus 54. And if you look at uh, a capture of a Macbeth that, from a raw processor and then brought into uh, Photoshop and we look at the lab values, the value is 35, 15, minus 55. And we can calculate what that delta E difference is. And as you can see here on screen, the difference is 5.66. We actually saw that in the previous slide. So if you want to talk about accuracy, you need to have a reference. You need to have what are the colors we're supposed to have, what are the colors that we did get? And then we use delta E to tell us what the differences are. And you can come to a conclusion whether or not this is an actual accurate capture or it's inaccurate. Basically, the conventional wisdom over the years has been that if you have a delta E of six or less, you've got a pretty good color match. It's, it's acceptable, uh, but your mileage may vary. Notice, for example, when we look at these lab values, that the big difference is an L star, the first value. Um, its reference should be an L star of 29, and the actual capture has an L star of 35. So that's the biggest difference really between these values um, that you see on screen. And, and the patch on the left looks a little darker than the patch on the right. But the bottom line here is if you want to talk about accuracy, you have to have a reference, you have to have known values that you want, you have to have some sort of measured value of what you get, 
and then you have to get a delta E value of these two solids, and that tells you how far apart they are visually, how accurate they are. If people don't give you a delta E metric when, when asked, when talking about accuracy, uh, they don't know what they're talking about. They're basically making stuff up. Uh, if they tell you, oh, well, the delta E difference is 3 or the delta E difference is 7, that at least gives you an idea of how they differ, and that uh, gives you some sort of a, a, an idea of how accurate or inaccurate a particular color match is. And we're only talking about two solid colors. These are the two images we're going to use to see whether or not encoding images into sRGB or ProPhoto RGB makes any difference. And we're assuming that... Uh, the image on the left, the Macbeth color checker, is within sRGB gamut. We'll see in a minute. But the image on the right of the white dog on snow is, is obviously falls into sRGB. And yes, I did check it by bringing the image into ColorThink and plotting it against sRGB. But this is kind of an example, the white dog on snow, of what people say uh, easily fits into sRGB. And therefore, you should set your raw processor in this case to bring this image into sRGB. Otherwise, your image will not be accurate, you'll have color shifts, blah, blah, blah. Let's see if that's true. Uh, this is what I did. Both images were raw, uh, actual raw captures uh, from a 5D Mark II. They were exported from Lightroom with absolutely identical settings. The only difference was the encoding selected in Lightroom. I picked sRGB and I picked ProPhoto RGB, but otherwise everything else is the same between the the two images that we're going to compare and the exports. Uh, the raw processor was set sort of at a default. They weren't, I didn't really mess around with the raw processor because that's really not pertinent. Um, so that could uh, affect accuracy if we were talking about the Macbeth. But uh, at this point, it's not really pertinent. So there are a couple of ways that we can look at this. For those of you who don't have sophisticated software, you're going to be seeing in the, a, a minute, you can do some of this in Photoshop. And basically what you can do is you can set your samplers uh, in Photoshop. I would set uh, the sampling for about a five by five or 11 by 11, depending on the resolution of the image. And you can see what I've done is I've got an image on the top, which is in sRGB from RAW, and the image at the bottom, which is in ProPhoto RGB from RAW. And I've put the four sampler points on the blue, green, red, and yellow patches. And you can see that the lab values between the two are extremely close. In fact, um, they're basically identical. Now, Photoshop is not the most accurate, and I use that term correctly, uh, way of looking at this because it truncates these lab values. Uh, you'll see in a few minutes that we'll be using software that gives us a much more uh, precise way of entering lab values with decimal points, but though we don't have a delta E metric here, if the lab values are the same, you're really going to have visually identical looking images. Yes, the delta E could be a bit above one or below one, and we'll get into that. But basically what you can see is that um, the images that are stacked together, the Macbeth on the top and the Macbeth on the bottom on the left side of the screen, they, for all practical purposes, look absolutely identical, and the lab values are identical. And so this is just a very quick way that one with Photoshop can sort of uh, compare color values. Now, the other way you can do this uh, in Photoshop is a visual process, which is by subtracting the two images using the apply command in Photoshop. And I've put up a, a URL for a uh, written tutorial that tells you basically how to do this. But you're subtracting one image from the other image, and you can visually see on screen where the color differences are. And you can see here this red uh, patch on the far right. It really isn't red, it's the cyan patch. But the apply image command shows us that there's a great deal of difference uh, visually here in these particular colors. Anywhere that you have a black value, the, the values are absolutely identical. And so the visual method sort of lets you see, oh, where is there a big difference here? Now the question is why? What you can see here, when we look at the lab values and we look at the two patches, is that the lab values are different in these two captures. Um, you can see that the uh, A star and B star values, especially the A star value, is different in the ProPhoto image versus the sRGB image. It's very subtle, and I'm not sure if you can see it on screen, but if we bring this 
uh, capture into ColorThink and plot it against sRGB, which you see on the right, you'll see that a little tiny bit of the cyan uh, falls outside of sRGB. So this is one of those situations where by using sRGB instead of Profoto, we could have used Adobe RGB as well, but in this case using sRGB, we've clipped that cyan color that we were able to actually capture. And that's why those lab values are different and that's why that square using the visual method in Photoshop is so easy to see and determine that there is a, a large visual difference and, and therefore a large color difference. And the reason that we have this difference is because the cyan is out of sRGB gamut. We made the wrong assumption in assuming this would fit totally into sRGB. Here again, you can see um, the image itself was brought into ColorThink Pro and all those little dots that you see inside sRGB are the actual colors of the McMath color checker. And there are these two little cyan patches that fall outside sRGB. And that is the reason that we don't see it. So now the best way to do this sort of testing is to use a product that was made to colorimetrically uh, examine different uh, images and, and color spaces and numbers. And I'm talking about ColorThink Pro. And so basically what I've done is I've taken the Profoto RGB image and the sRGB image from the raw processor into ColorThink Pro. And it too has a really nifty sort of visual uh, methodology of showing you where the colors are above or below a delta E that I can set above in that particular slider. So anything that's green that you see on the far right is essentially a delta E of one or less. And all those little tiny yellow uh, patches fall between a 1 and a 4 delta E. But what we want to do is look at the report over on the right. This is where we get the real uh, facts about the differences between encoding in these two color spaces. So I'll go over this and, and then move on. But basically, we're looking at 197,000 colors. There's 197,000 different color values in these two images. And when we compared the delta E, the average difference of those 197,000 colors is 0 0.52. So basically, it's half of one delta E. Um, it's just not visible. What ColorThink does, it's very useful, as you can see down further below, is it gives us the worst 10%. And it tells us that of the 19,701 colors that are the worst delta E, the biggest differences between the two, the average is 1.17, so they're, they're basically invisible. Um, the max delta E is 2.80. That means that there's a single patch of the 197,000 colors. There's one patch in that entire group that has a delta E of 2.80. So right away, what we can see from this is that it makes no difference whether you encode the image into Profoto RGB or sRGB. For all practical purposes, the differences are invisible. So the accuracy myth, I want to go over this. The proponents are telling us that we need to use the smallest working space and then they discuss accuracy, but I don't think they understand the term and they can't prove their point. Again, for accuracy, you need to have a reference and you need to have something to compare it to, the actual image data that you're trying to compare to the reference. And then you can say, using a report like we just saw, how different are they? So in the example of the dog on white, there's no reference. Um, so we're not talking about accuracy here. We're talking about difference. And so what we're trying to discuss is the fact that if you take this image from raw and encode it into sRGB, which is what we're told we should be doing, or we take the image and encode it into Profoto RGB, which we're told we shouldn't, there's no difference. I mean, the differences numerically are insignificant and tiny. And we'll talk about those differences towards the end but um, this has nothing to do with accuracy. So if you hear people talk about accuracy, the hair on your neck should go up and you need to ask them, give me a delta E value or an average delta E. How many samples are you talking about? What is the average delta E? What's the max delta E? If they can't give you an answer to that question, then you probably want to ignore them because they really don't know what they're talking about. So in review, the colometric differences between encoding in sRGB or Profoto RGB is tiny. It's insignificant. We can't really even see the difference. Um, in the case of the Macbeth color checker, 
by making the wrong assumption that it could fit into sRGB, we actually have less accurate color, and we saw that in the slide about accuracy. We've clipped some of the color that really exists in the Macbeth that falls outside sRGB. So that was the wrong choice to pick sRGB. Um, visually, on a wide gamut display, there's no difference using either working space. Uh, I showed you those uh, screen captures. Uh, the lab values are identical. They look the same, except for the cyan patch, uh, even if they fit within sRGB. So attempting to place data that only fits into sRGB gamut into sRGB is kind of time-consuming and unnecessary. You're much better off simply picking a large gamut encoding space uh, like Profoto RGB and moving on it, because there's no harm or foul. If you do the opposite, you have the possibility of clipping colors, which is not a good idea. Um, the white dog easily fits into sRGB. It's no better, no worse if you put it into Profoto RGB or Adobe RGB. Numerically, the results are the same. Now, where Profoto RGB does become a problem is that there are device values, for example, uh, blue 255, which are not real colors. They fall outside human vision. And so if you're making up colors numerically, you could be producing what are called imaginary colors, colors that don't really exist. Um, but that's going to be very difficult to do converting from raw images into Profoto RGB. The other thing is that some of these colors will fall outside the gamut of your display. But they're colors that you were able to capture. They're colors that you're able to print. And so the limitation here is your display. So that's a basically what I have for you today. I have a few more slides uh, that I'm going to present that are optional for you to view if you want to, kind of going over the methodology that I used for this testing and some other things that I found. Uh, but if you're satisfied that colometrically there's no difference uh, in using Profoto RGB versus sRGB, as I would hope you would based on the data, then I uh, wish you a good day. So let's talk about the testing methodology. First of all, does exporting the same image identically in Lightroom produce differences? Well, no. The first thing that I did here is I exported the dog two times uh, in sRGB, and then I brought them into ColorThink and produced a Delta E report. And as you can see, it's zero across the board. And so what I wanted to find out was, if I export an image more than one time, is there some sort of dither being introduced? Is there some rounding errors in this particular process? And the first thing we can see, at least in terms of Lightroom, is no. The differences are not due to multiply processing the same image the same way. Next, how does the rendering settings in a raw processor play a role colometrically? This is kind of interesting. What I did is I exported the dog the first way that you saw previously, and then what I did is I turned off sharpening in Lightroom. That's the only change that I made, and I exported that. Uh, so again, I used sRGB and Profoto RGB and turned off sharpening and exported sRGB and Profoto RGB and did my delta E uh, comparison. So on the left, which you can see with sharpening off, my average delta E is 0.55. With sharpening on, my average delta E is 0.52. Interestingly enough, if you look at sharpening off, the um, max delta E, the one, one single worst patch, its value is 2.58, whereas sharpening on, the uh, average delta E went up a tiny bit to 2.80. So what this basically tells me is that, again, there are tiny, tiny, tiny differences uh, using either method. But it tells me that uh, the rendering controls, in this case sharpening, does play a little bit of a role. And I bring this up because I, I don't know, and I don't know that I'll ever know without having uh, somebody from inside Adobe tell me, but it, it would appear that perhaps, and this is a speculation, in terms of the sharpening, maybe the sharpening is being applied in a different color space or in a different part of the processing path, perhaps in the uh, actual RGB working spaces, uh, but I don't know. So it's possible that if, if the sharpening is applied in sRGB and then Profoto RGB, we'd see slight differences, but we'll never know. And, and likely the small differences are just um, 
you know, rounding errors, and, and uh, we'll talk about some of the differences that are possible uh, in, these, in these small differences. But it, the point here is that the rendering controls can play a very subtle difference in our reporting. Uh, different converters. I figured it would be a good idea to use a completely different raw converter just to see if we get a similar result. So on the left, we have Profoto RGB from the raw image, and on the right, we have sRGB from the raw image. And I used a different raw processor, a very, very good uh, raw processor called Iridium Developer. And then we have our report on the right side. And as you can see, I basically get the same results. In other words, I've encoded in a small color space, sRGB. I've encoded in a large color space, Profoto RGB, using two different raw processors. And basically, the reports are very, very similar. It's, I'm, I'm actually surprised how similar they are. But what this tells me is that whether I use Lightroom or Iridian Developer, uh, again, I can simply pick the large encoding color space, Profoto RGB. And the differences between doing that or using sRGB is basically insignificant. Uh, but it is interesting how slight the differences are. And again, we're talking about 197,000 colors in two different raw processors. Again, nothing to do with accuracy. We're only talking about color difference. Um, lastly, I thought it would be interesting to capture the Macbeth color checker, setting the camera to JPEG and capturing the image in sRGB and Adobe RGB. And so, um, what you're seeing, again, I'm using Photoshop. On the far left, I have an info palette, uh, sRGB uh, on the far left, and just to the right of it, Adobe RGB, because I can't set my camera to give me Profoto in a JPEG. And uh, you can see that the differences are a bit larger than had we shot RAW and did the two encodings using um, a RAW processor into either sRGB or Profoto. And, uh, talking about accuracy, at the, just below those two info palettes, you can see the actual lab values of the reference. That's the, the lab color of the synthetic Macbeth. The differences between capturing sRGB versus Adobe RGB using a JPEG on the camera is a delta E of 3.89. It's not that big, and hopefully visually on screen you can see that the, the patch on the right, at least to me, appears a little bit darker. Uh, but we're seeing almost a four delta E difference just setting the camera and making the same capture. Um, I don't know that that's pertinent, but I thought it would be interesting to illustrate that. <clears throat> so why these small differences? Uh, I did ask a couple of peers, color geeks, people I respect, what they thought of my results. And again, a lot of this is speculation because we just don't know what's going on in these particular raw processors. But there are small differences colometrically with the two working spaces, and the reasons could be rounding errors in the processing of the data. Um, just not sending out the same data identically at the same time, but just differences in how they deal creating the data uh, when you pick different RGB working spaces. It could be metameric errors, noise, lack of averaging of the device values is what I was told. Um, in the case of Lightroom versus Iridium Developer, the differences in the color engines and the processing are going to be uh, possibly significant. But again, we didn't see any real differences uh, when the rubber hits the road between using sRGB or Profoto RGB. For all practical purposes, they were identical. And that's the bottom line. You can encode in sRGB or you can code in Profoto RGB. It doesn't really make any difference whatsoever. So the people who are telling us that if you have an image that fits with an sRGB, you should encode an sRGB, have no proof that this is the case. And uh, I think I've proven just the opposite, that it really doesn't make any difference. So rather than potentially clip colors because the image may fall outside sRGB, if you're working with a raw processor like Lightroom, uh, set the encoding color space to Profoto RGB and move on. That's about it. Uh, I'd love to hear from you if you have any comments, and I thank you for your time.